you would please just describe the life of William Seymour just prior to and during the Azusa Street Revival. The life of William J. Seymour was characterized by rejection and also by honor. Rejection because he was a black and a victim of discrimination and because he was a Pentecostal. But also honor because he became the central figure of the greatest movement in, his, in the history of the church. To understand his life during the Azusa Street Revival, one must understand how his life preceded the revival. For William Seymour, life was a matter of survival in poverty and in a society in which it was taboo to be black in America. He also developed smallpox, which caused blindness in his left eye. But he had a yearning to understand the things of God. When Charles Parham took his teaching and evangelistic ministry to the vicinity of Houston in 1905, Seymour attended Parham's Bible School to learn about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Due to the Jim Crow segregation laws, William Seymour sat apart from the white students, and this impacted Seymour's ministry. The core of the teaching was that speaking in tongues was the initial physical evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the tongues would be intelligible for missionary evangelism. William believed in it so much that he taught on the baptism with the Holy Spirit before he even spoke in tongues. A black sister named Neely Terry and William, a member of the Nazarene Church led by Reverend Julia W. Hutchinson, heard Seymour preach while she visited Houston in 1905. And he recommended, oh, she recommended him to Reverend Hutchinson as a candidate to pastor their can congregation in Los Angeles. Parham helped Seymour with his train ticket. Seymour arrived in Los Angeles in February 1906. He took the liberty to teach on speaking in tongues as the initial physical evidence of receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit. On March 4th, just two weeks later, Seymour arrived at the church and found that Reverend Julia Hutchinson locked him out. The Holiness Church Association of Southern California also rejected Seymour and his teaching. However, Edward S. Lee, a member of the Nazarene Church, appreciated Seymour's preaching and invited Seymour to conduct Bible studies at his home. After that, he began preaching in, in Richard and Ruth Asbury's home at 214 North Bonnie Bray Street. Five weeks later, the spirit fell and the revival began. Lee spoke in tongues. Seymour shared Lee's experience on Bonnie Bray Street and then many there began speaking in tongues. People began coming from everywhere to attend the front porch meetings and listen to Seymour preach. Even Pastor Hutchinson and others from her church and holiness congregations attended and began speaking in tongues and Seymour finally began speaking in tongues. So tell us, uh, Vera, how, how did uh, the Azusa Street Revival begin? Well, the front porch finally collapsed with so many people on it. So Seymour looked for another place to conduct meetings and where he and his wife could have their own quarters for this reason, they moved to the former Stevens African Methodist Episcopal Church at 312 Azusa Street in April. It used to be a library stable and tenement house. It was very run down and it came to be called the Apostolic Faith Mission. The press gave the revival publicity since the meetings were so unusual. The public fueled, the publicity fueled the revival. Frank Bartleman also created publicity. 
because in his ministry he had written written many articles and tracts and consistently went throughout Los Angeles telling pastors and congregations what was happening at Azusa Street and encouraging churches to ask God for revival. The building sat up to 350 people. Many people had to stand outside listening through the windows. The size of the building was 40 by 60 feet. The benches were placed in a rectangular shape. They were nothing but planks resting on nail kegs, and at first there was not even a pulpit. While the meetings were conducted on the first floor, the second floor contained the office and quarters for the Seymours and other residents. The overflow room was also upstairs. It was known as the Pentecostal Upper Room, where seekers left speaking in tongues. Revival progressed rapidly. By the summer of 1906, 150 people had received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. By the fall, it picked up even more steam. People from around the world began to attend, such as Berndt Bernstein, a missionary from North China, and had heard of this latter rain. News of the revival spread throughout North America, Europe, and the rest of the world by the world by the word of mouth and published articles in sympathetic holiness publications. Seymour with Clara Lum published the Apostolic Faith between September nineteen six and nineteen oh eight, May of eight, beginning with five thousand copies. They eventually distributed forty thousand copies by nineteen oh seven. So, Verna, how was uh, Azusa Street different uh, and similar to Acts chapter 2? Both had global impacts, but the day of Pentecost was the birth of the church. On the day Pente of Pentecost, a new dispensation had bo was born. The dispensation, both of grace, often called the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost came to form a church. This church was to consist of all the redeemed, which, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or rich. The observance of a day, the beginning of a dispensation, the marketing of the birth of the church. Pentecost is a glorious experience for the believer. The New Testament area began with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The result of this baptism with the Holy Spirit was Acts 2.4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit. Then was the consequence of the baptism with the Spirit. The baptism was a unique initiatory experience. The fullness was intended to be the continuing, the permanent result and the norm, the outward sign was always to be praying in other tongues. The baptism with the Holy Spirit given to the 120 on the day of Pentecost was a new, unique, unrepeatable sign in the history of the redemption. It marked the end of the old and the beginning of the new dispensation with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. Christ had finished his atoning work and was fulfilled. All that was symbol, symbolized by the shadowy temple worship. Now and for this purpose, the Holy Spirit was poured out. The foreshadowed reality could be revealed and experienced. Hebrews chapter 8 through 10 tells us that the earthly high priests of the old dispensations are no longer needed. Christ, the true high priest, had offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. Sacrificial worship was no longer necessary. The Holy Spirit now dwells in the hearts of his children. Believers can constitute a spiritual temple built of living stones. 
Though the Holy Spirit is omniscient in a special sense, his re residence is now on earth. The New Testament church is the home of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives among us, for we have become the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in us. Pentecost brought the last era of the history of redemption. The baptism with the Holy Spirit experienced by the 120 at Pentecost marked the beginning of this new and last dispensation. Therefore, it was the turning point in the history of redemption, and as such it did not need any repetition, nor could it be repeated, for according to Jesus' promise, the Holy Spirit had come to abide with the church forever. The uniqueness of the baptism with the Holy Spirit of the 120 at Pentecost is also evident from the fact that it was accompanied by signs that have not been repeated. The sound of the rush of a mighty wind and the tongues of fire on the heads of the disciples were significant because the wind and the fire and had been signs that announced the coming of the Lord in the Old Testament. Fire was a symbol of God's presence at Sinai. Here was a fire be again as a sign of God's presence. Furthermore, the flames were cloven to let the Jews know the event of speaking in tongues was kosher, acceptable with God. The separation of the cloven flames indicated that the abilities to pray in tongues were each separate and distinct and were permanently given as it was the Holy Spirit. The miraculous unusual signs let the disciples know that God, the Holy Spirit for whom they had been praying, was now coming. Later, when others received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, those previous signs were not part of the experience. There was usually one sign, the speaking with other tongues. The fact that the 120 spoke in existing languages, which they had never heard, learned, was probably unique. This miracle was not necessary to be to make the hearers understand what the 120 said. The speaking in existing foreign languages was probably meant as a sign that from now on the church would become universal. All scriptural references prior to Pentecost are prophetic. All references after Pentecost treat the baptism with the Holy Spirit as an existing reality. While the day of Pentecost was an initiatory an unrepeatable event, Azusa Street was to be the norm for everyday church life. Um, can you uh, describe what took place at Azusa Street and what participants had to say, such as Florence Crawford? Florence Crawford was an early worker at the Azusa Mission. She later moved to Portland, Oregon, where she established the Ap Apostolic Faith Mission Crawford said, how I thank God that I heard of the latter outpouring of the Holy Ghost. He led me to that little mission. He was not a fine hall. It wasn't a fine hall, just a, an old barn-like building with only an old board laid on two chairs for an altar. The floor was carpeted with sawdust the walls and beams blackened by smoke. I looked around to see if anybody saw me go in. I had found a people that had the experience I wanted. That Friday afternoon at the mission, the preacher stopped and said, somebody in this place wants something from God. I pushed the chairs away in front of me and fell at the altar. And the fire fell, and God sanctified me. The power of God went through me like thousands of needles. Later, when she received the baptism with the Holy Spirit, she said, As I sat in my chair in the mission, the Holy Ghost fell from heaven 
and a rushing mighty wind filled the room. The tongue that never spoke another word but English began to magnify and praise God in another language. I was speaking in Chinese and it was the sweetest thing I ever heard in my life. The power of God shook my being and rivers of joy and divine love flooded my soul. Oh, it was a wonderful, but the greatest joy to my heart was that I had received the power to witness to lost souls that they might find Jesus. Crawford had three attacks of spinal meningitis early in life. It had affected her eyes so, so badly that she always had to wear glasses. After she was baptized with the Holy Spirit, she went to the mission and told what wonderful things the Lord had done for her and had had them pray for her. For her eyes were healed. She also had lung trouble for years and had to live in Southern California for her health. And God healed her of that. She said, I was thin, diseased, broken down in every part of my body. And when I had paid the full price and in, in simple childlike faith, prayed that I might get my health back again and be a witness for him in this world the healing streams begin to flow. William H. Durham pastored the North Avenue Mission in Chicago attended by numerous early leaders of the Pentecostal movement. He published a Pentecostal math monthly periodical the Pentecostal Testimony. He is best known for teaching the doctrine of the finished work of Christ. Durham heard of the work of God in Azusa Street Mission, Los Angeles, and went there. On Friday evening, March 1st, he said, His mighty power came over me until I jerked and quaked until uh, under it for about three hours. It was strange and wonderful, and yet glorious. He worked my whole body up, one section at a time. First my arms, then my limbs, then my body, then my head, then my face, then my chin, and finally at 1 a.m. Saturday, March the 2nd, after being under the power for three hours, he finished the work on my vocal organs and spoke spoke through me in unknown tongues. Durham participated in the Azusa Street Mission meetings. He taught the finished work doctrine at Azusa Street Mission. This contra contradicted the second work of sanctification taught by Charles F. Parham, William Seymour, and other early Pentecostals. His views, however, were later adopted by many Pentecostals and Charismatics. Seymour locked Durham out of the Zusa Street Mission for preaching the finished work message. Durham planted another mission in Los Angeles and many faithful people from the Azusa Street Mission followed him. Consequently, this greatly con contributed to the decline of the Zusa Street Revival. Durham said of William Seymour, He is the meekest man I have ever met. He walks and talks with God. His power is in his weakness. He, he seems to maintain a helpless dependence on God and is as simple-hearted as a little child and at the same time is so filled with God that you feel the love and power. Every time you get near him, so, uh, what, uh, what was your perspective of, of, of the Azusa Street Revival? Right? I believe that the Azusa Street Revival was a breakthrough which ushered in the Pentecostal movement. All the revivals during the previous 2,000 years included the Welsh Revival, Topeka, and bon Bonnie Bray Street kindled the fire until the Azusa Street Revival broke through and fired up the Pentecostal movement. Azusa Street continued 
where Acts 2, 4 left off. And how about um, the, uh, the doctrine? Seymour, as instructed by Parham, believed and taught that all missionaries go, they could go forth into any nation speaking in tongues, and the Holy Spirit would fill their mouths with the language of those people. Thus, the missionaries would not need to learn the language of the tribe of, or nation. What do you, uh, how do you define the baptism with the Holy Spirit? The baptism with the Holy Spirit is the reception of the Holy Spirit as confirmed by speaking in tongues. This is the key to the priesthood of all believers. If all do not have the Holy Spirit, we are not all priests and, and we are not all His. This statement means that all believers have received the Holy Spirit as taught by all Christian traditions and by Paul the Apostle. In Romans 8, 9, and 11, and it is consistently confirmed by speaking in tongues in the New Testament in Acts 2, 8, 10, and 19. Well, uh, what do you uh, make people that uh, discuss the baptism in the Holy Spirit versus the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Pentecostals often speak of baptism in the Holy Spirit rather than with the Spirit. But the Greek preposition may be translated either way. The expression chosen, says John Stott, is likely to depend on whether one considers what water baptism should be administered by immersion or by effusion. Those who practice immersion speak of the baptism in the Spirit, presumably because they think of the Spirit as the element in which one is plunged. Since it is when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon people that they are said to be baptized. However, baptism with the Holy Spirit is preferable. When, when Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, Jesus places the Holy Spirit in us, and the Holy Spirit places us in the body of Christ. It is the important, it is so important to have education and constructive debate. Since this is how theology is formed, viewpoints are expressed truth is revealed, education occurs, church leaders are produced, and movements are born. After all, William Seymour was a product of Charles Parham's Bible School. Consequently, the Holy Spirit ushered in the Azusa Spirit, the Azusa Street Revival, and this Pentecostal movement. How would you describe William Seymour's legacy? Many people influenced by Seymour started Pentecostal ministries around the world, serving as centers for revival. Many people perceived that Azusa Street revival ushered in the end times revival. He fostered, an, he fostered unity between the ethnic groups when the revival began. He was criticized by holiness leaders and eventually was held in contempt by Charles Parham and even by Frank Bartleman. Seymour was eventually disregarded by the leadership of the white Pentecostals denominations because he was not a contributing founder. And because Seymour departed from his original premise, the speaking in tongues was the initial physical ed evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Denominational leaders resented his departure from the premise because they held it as true and their, de their denominations were based on this premise. These new denominational leaders claimed Topeka as the beginning of the Pentecostal movement and dismissed the Azusa Street Revival. But the historical record shows that the because of the Azusa Street Revival, now 100 years later, nearly 600 million Pentecostals comprise the largest group within 
Christian-like Christianity today. Seymour's greatness today can be found in his humble desire to be used of God and his unwavering faith that speaking in tongues is for today, for all people, from this premise, he did not swerve. What have you done? What, what are your credentials, so to speak? Tell us a little bit about you. Okay, I graduated from high school in Edith, Oklahoma, and uh, one year of Bible school mm -hmm. there. Brother P.C. Nelson was the fo founder. And, and tell us where you, you studied. You studied? Yeah, after uh, the one year of Bible school in Edens, Oklahoma, uh, my folks and I came to San Diego. And um, then uh, I met Stan, and we were married. And um, after his ship sank and he got out of the service the first time, after he was enlisted for eight years, he went to school at Fuller Seminary, and they had a nice little ruling they made. Uh, if the husbands uh, were p paying for their uh, education, the wives could attend free. So when I and they, uh, so I s go with them and I sit in the classes too. So they uh, recognized me as one of theirs too. And then uh, later on, uh, and then he, he uh, went to Linda Vista Baptist Bible College uh, before that. But um, this Kings. Um, Kingsway, Kingsway uh, uh, Seminary in Iowa, wasn't it? They came uh, and uh, gave me a, a, an honorary doctorate. Beautiful. And you've uh, in, in the, in the um, Assembly of God Church there in Escondido. You've written a book. Yes, and I write a lot of these sermons. Tell us the name of the book. The name of the book is The Baptism with the Holy Spirit. Verna M. Lindsay. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one last question, if you wouldn't mind. And the name of the Bible college was Southwestern, a big AG college you didn't mention. And in, in, in uh, Oklahoma, Southwestern Bible College. Now, Brother P.C. Nelson uh, joined with Guy Shields School in Texas and Raymond T. Ritchie School. And now that is Assemblies of God, uh, Southwestern University in Waxahachie, Texas. Have you been in a revival yourself where the move of God was very powerful like, say, Brownsville or Topeka or the Wales Revival or anything like that? Yes, when I got the baptism, uh, Opal Bird was uh, helping pray with me and Mildred Reese, some of the young people. And so um, I was kneeling at the altar in front of the church. You know, after church we'd have prayer meetings and seeking the baptism like they had on the day of Pentecost and waiting upon the Lord. And then later, I uh, went on in a prayer room, and we were helping others. And so Oprah Bird uh, said to one of the other people seeking the baptism, they come on, get your baptism. Verna's got hers. I said, I haven't got mine. She said, well, you were speaking in tongues. <laughs> and so um, I, I, she said, well, if you're not satisfied, come on, let's pray some more. So I did. And so when I went home, uh, that night, you know, after you church. You feel the move of God in a powerful way. Yes. Can you describe that for us? And so when I went home and then ready for bed, I thought, I'm going to kneel down and pray some more. My Lord is so good. And um, I could still speak in tongues. I heard myself speaking in tongues. And I've, I've got to t tell you this little verse. After uh, Jesus um, promised us the Holy Spirit, he prayed the Father to send the Spirit. He prayed the Father to send the Spirit, the promised Holy Ghost, to comfort us. Our Lord empowers us to tell to others of Jesus' love and saving power and healing power and keeping power. But P.C. Nelson and, and um, was a friend of our mother gave, uh, from our music store, gave a couple of uh, pianos to his Bible school. But uh, Raymond T. Ritchie, he was used of God to heal, pray, and God healed many people. 
my mother was in a church service when he came to Coffeeville and prayed. And of course, the other saints, all of us praying together, the praying saints. God healed my mother of Bright's disease. She had to take a big bottle of medicine every week until God healed her and she didn't have to take it anymore. And she lived to be 90 and a half. Was that the song you wanted to sing to us? Yes. So did you do it? Oh, blessed Jesus, our precious Savior. He came from heaven to die for us. He was resurrected and went to glory. He promised to come again for us. It may be evening, it may be morning. He'll guide us to that new made shore. He'll take us with him to dwell forever. Oh, what a gathering to part no more. He prayed the Father to send his spirit, the promised Holy Ghost to comfort us. Our Lord empowers us to tell to others of Jesus' love and saving power and healing power and keeping power. Oh, the Bible in a nutshell, isn't it? Where did that song come from? I made it up. You wrote that? I wrote that. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> that Thank awesome. the Lord. Thank the Lord is so good to he us, is so isn't good he? Good Praise and the to be Lord. Praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. The promises unto you and everyone Thank you so that much. loves the Lord.